cover a few topics. Uh, basically, general allergy and uh, sinusitis is somewhat you know, has some relationships. We're also going to talk a little bit about asthma. We're going to talk about uh, some food allergy and insect allergy. Generally, though, we, we talk about typically toxicity when we talk about massive stings. When you have toxicity with the Africanized bees, we're talking about t uh, most likely 50 stings or higher. We recommend that you go ahead and go in to seek um, urgent care type of a situation, even if you don't feel that bad, if you happen to be unfortunate enough for that to happen. We've already had uh, this year about uh, four cases of in the neighborhood of a hundred plus things that I'm aware of that I've been called about in the emergency department here typically we have a couple of dozen a year uh, that are in that type of category some as much as uh, 1500 stings um, and interestingly, the highest number of stings that we've had here is in someone who actually who lived, and some of the lower ones we've had a few fatalities with them. So the main, the main deal is though, it's related mainly with starting up machinery like lawnmowers and, and weed eaters and types of machinery. And if you inspect the area before you start up the machinery, that would be the best thing to do because if there's an Africanized colony that has moved into the area, which typically happens when they swarm about this time of the year, they establish new locations, there will be lots of bees, a lot of activity around an area. And then if you get close enough, sometimes it's kind of like ringing the fire alarm and they just go nuts. You've never, if you've never seen a colony that's mad. It's one of the most incredible experiences you, you could see. It's right out of uh, science fiction movies, you know, where they're, run, you know, run, here they come. Thousands and thousands of them are, are attacking at the same time. It is absolutely incredible. I call it the living experience of a, of a B-class movie because it absolutely, people's descriptions are of that type. So the main feature is exactly what he said, get away. And if you uh, are worried about going into a home, going into a vehicle where there are other people around, don't worry about that. Because you'll confine someone else or yourself, you'll confine the number of stings based on what's on you. As soon as you go in a vehicle, in a building, the bees detect a rate, they have a radar, sonar type of an aspect that they don't, they basically call the attack off. They'll still be crawling around on your body, but they've already stung, they're done. One sting and done, kamikazes, they die. But the ones that haven't stung, some of them will go ahead and sting, the others will go for the light, go for windows or light sources, the attack is basically called off. So you won't threaten others that are in the car, well you will, they'll, they may get a few stings, but generally speaking you will not threaten others significantly in a home, in a car. So you just need to get in a closed container or what Mike said. That's all I'll say about the Africanized bees, but I'll be glad to, I'll be af here afterwards if somebody wants to ask questions about any of these topics. The most common allergic disease, though, actually is with allergic rhinitis. And uh, these, are, these are things that, uh, you know, we all hear about. Oh, I got allergies, I got hay fever. Uh, most people are familiar with those symptoms. It's 20, 25% of the population. So, um, you know, it is that. Now, one, the one thing I probably want to emphasize the most about it, let's see if I can accomplish this goal. <laughs> I feel good already. I'm able to technically do this now. Is it shows about what the frequency is of allergic rhinitis. Extremely common. But the most important thing I wanted to bring up about it, because I got a good number of slides, is I want to show you a few things that that often is not talked about. And that is how it affects people's lives, how it affects their quality of lives. I, I, I kind of get a kick out of the, the, uh, this, this slide where it says uh, aller nasal allergy suffers feelings during allergy season. And uh, we're looking at symptoms that are not related typically to the runny nose, sneezing, itching of the nose. We're looking at symptoms that are kind of more generalized, how you feel, tired, and uh, <clears throat> the blue indicates frequently, and the orange is sometimes. And if you look how much, what it does as far as their quality of life, it significantly affects individuals who are involved. Tired, 
miserable, what a great, what a great term, irritable, depressed or blue, and my favorite is embarrassed. Had a patient today that said, every time I get, over, get ready to have a meal, my nose just begins to drip like a drippy faucet. And I'm so embarrassed when I go out to eat, and, and I don't want to go out to eat with anyone because it's, it's embarrassing. So the quality of life, when you look at the other side over there, it's, that's what I want to emphasize is we trivialize this condition a lot of times, and certainly those that have it to a very mild level, that's understandable that, uh, oh, oh, that's all you've got. But it really affects the patients I see or that make it to my office are typically more involved. Uh, and here's some other quality of life type measures that are pretty typical and you can pretty much see that that it uh, is affected, it affects people in these different capacities. Allergic rhinitis is also linked to other diseases. Sinusitis is the most common. How many of you uh, have a diagnosis? Well, I shouldn't ask that. I'm not going to ask that. Sinusitis is so common, and often people say, what, what is the difference between having allergies or allergic rhinitis and sinusitis? Here's what it is. Allergic rhinitis typically affects the nose, the lining of the nose. Sinusitis is extension from the nose into the areas. There are passages that go to the sinuses. So if we were to say an extension of an allergy could, in, could involve the complication of sinusitis, the pressure in here often leads to sinus infections, but certainly discomfort. When we have barometric pressure changes like we just had with fronts uh, that come through, oh, somebody told me, you need to label this low pressure or something like that, that people get these pressure things, and it, and it blocks the sinus cavities. Now, some will have sinusitis, absolutely, that have no allergies whatsoever because they have inflamed sinuses, and uh, that is their primary diagnosis. So it goes along with complications of allergic rhinitis, and it can be sinusitis on its own that has no relationship with sinusitis. Kind of like if, if, if someone has any other and, and then a complication of that can be with uh, hypertension, a complication can be with uh, the kidneys failing, or it can wear out the heart. Complication can affect the heart. Diabetes, complications of that. So this is kind of in the same line, but you can also have sinusitis allergy. Affecting the ears, asthma, look at those percentages. That's, per that's pretty impressive, I think. 25 to 40% of patients with allergic rhinitis have asthma. 75 to 80% of patients with asthma have allergic rhinitis. Interesting. Treatment of allergic rhinitis improves asthma. So there's a good, there's a good reason to do that. And then with the eyes and with uh, dental malocclusions, if someone's, for example, a chronic mouth breather, <sighs> that can result, especially in the developmental years with, uh, young, with uh, those who are, uh, who are still growing, it can affect them more. Many types of rhinitis, in addition to allergic, although we do know the, the allergic ones as listed over there, but you have a lot of non-allergic types too, and uh, that can be related to frequent infections. Vasomotor is just an instability of the nasal lining in reference to the tissues and the nerve innervation that causes abnormal swelling and shrinkage of the tissues. Medications, uh, are, are any of you all familiar with the Afrin nose? getting hooked on decongestant nasal sprays, heard of that? Medication, some other medicines too, people get hooked on uh, the nasal sprays, the decongestants, brings me a lot of business. I like the Afrin people, neosinephrine, they're my friends. But there is a place for that, that type of medication for very short term use and it's very helpful. Anatomic problems and, and all, so there are other conditions outside of allergy. And Here's some of the signs and symptoms that, that you can uh, look for. Allergic salute, I'll, I'll just do it one time. It's, you know, the, that one. <laughs> Typically the kids do that one and so. Here's a little bit of a look of the, uh, on one, the allergic shiners where someone's mouth breathing. These lines under the eyes that often indicate swelling under the eyes. I think they could have done a little bit better picture than that. Someone who's got a little bit more remarkable swelling anyway. Uh, remarkable swelling under the eyes. And I think that last one's really a 
pose position on that mouth breather there. But anyway, kind of shows you there's different ways that we can diagnose it as far as with uh, testing and all, and certainly with examination being close. I won't go into these things in detail because we got too many things to talk about. And uh, so the treatment principles are education. We always want to know about it as much as we can. We want to know our triggers. I've often said with allergy, and this is, this is one of those little pearls that goes, goes with a lot of things, but if someone knows their triggers for allergy, if they know what situations, if they know this weather is going to get them, if they go outside in this type of weather, they're going to likely end up with a, a problem, whatever, then you develop tactics by which to either avoid it or pre-medicate before the exposure, and that's often more than half the battle right there. That's a lot of my practice right there, what I just said with that, is trying to help people identify the triggers. Of course, having medications and immunotherapy is with the allergy injections and those that it would be appropriate for. So education, I'm gonna go on. Pearls, here's uh, some more. I guess we're gonna use that term here. In reference to allergy, the most common inhalant allergy is dust mites. All of the department stores now carry these allergy proof in casings. I don't know if you're aware of it, but uh, they all have them now. Uh, Target, Walmart, Kmart, Marshalls, Pennies, Kohl's. I think I covered a ball that I can think of offhand. Probably Sam's too now. I haven't, haven't checked that out yet. But anyway, these allergy proof in casings actually cause, it's, it's like a super filter, basically whatever's in the pillow, whatever's in the mattress, which is the number one source of dust mite exposure that will keep them in there. Air goes in and out, but no particles, no dust mite particles. So that is the most effective thing that you can do. Using special filters can be helpful. Uh, you know, cigarette smoke, of course. Uh, keeping the windows closed during sun times of the year, like now, when we have pollen seasons and this type of thing. Okay, so when we talk about treatment, we're talking about these different levels and there's different treatments that are available for the different levels. That's all I wanted to kind of point out here. We have a stepwise treatment just like we have for allergic rhinitis. We also have for sinusitis. We have for asthma also. Stepwise treatment. So whatever you're doing, you know, the doctor that you go to, if you go to a doctor for your condition, whatever they're doing, if you just give them one shot at it, well there's often another step or two that you can take or three or four. And if that doesn't work, of course, then you go to the specialist. Um, inhaled uh, medications or topical medications are going to be more effective than the antihistamines. A lot of people aren't, aren't aware of that. Antihistamine use, these are, these are names of studies over on, the, on our left. And the study results uh, show, and the dot in the middle, the, the range is listed there, and then the dot in the middle kind of gives you the average. So the nasal steroids, and now there's an over-the-counter one. Everybody familiar with Nasacort? Nasacort nasal spray? The first one, excuse me, the first uh, nasal spray that's a steroid nasal spray that's available <clears throat> over-the-counter. Pretty cool. All the rest of them have always been by prescription. So you can always try the antihistamine first, but now you've got one over the counter, you can bypass the doctor's appointment. <laughs> to referring to a specialist, of course there are several things that you know you can you can tell that if it's not working out well for multiple, multiple reasons, you, you can uh, you you should be referred for that. And then the allergy injections and uh, the summary of this part would be um, allergic rhinitis, sinusitis are linked diseases, so common. And I've often said this, that a lot of our chronic or long-standing allergic rhinitis patients will evolve into our sinusitis patients by middle age and later life. They feel bad, quality of life issues, multiple factors and options to consider when treating the patients, but the rewards are immense because the patients, patients are grateful. Well. That's a, I like that one. <laughs> and successful treatment may prevent future disease. I'm going to talk about asthma for a moment, and this is for all in, in that regard. Um, all that wheezes is not asthma, but that certainly is one of the most descriptive type of symptoms for patients who have asthma. 
all that cough, you know, when we say cough, what, what, what does cough really mean? When I get a phone call and, uh, from a patient that says, give me something for my cough, I reject it immediately and give back to my nurse, ah, not enough information, as opposed to too much information, not enough information. The most common symptom in asthma patients is cough. But there's so many other things that can cause cough that, uh, you know, we have to have more information. But number one symptom, and I never can quite understand this, when patients who have asthma and they develop like an upper respiratory infection, they say they're coughing like crazy, give me something for the cough. And I say, well, you got asthma. Use your inhaler. Oh, didn't think about that. It's like, whoa, well, it felt different, you know, or it's an infection, you know. Well, yeah, but that's one of the most common triggers of asthma. So cough, wheezing, shortness of breath. But in most asthmatics, if you wait for an asthma attack, difficulty breathing to make the diagnosis, you're way behind the ball game in, in that regard. So you want to catch it early. You want to, if, if symptoms are not working well, you're getting that diagnosis of bronchitis again and I have some wheezing, I have a lot of coughing, and you get that antibiotic and you get that cough medicine that's not working well, unfortunately you may have the onset of asthma. Recurrent bronchitis, if there's not a real good reason for it, a lot of times that's misdiagnosed, misdiagnosed as recurrent or you know, episodic bronchitis, and asthma needs to be entertained in, the, in those individuals. And especially if there are obvious triggers that, that do that, like when I mow the grass, or when I'm cleaning and stirring up the house dust, when I get around the cat, things such as that. When I go outside, and I'm just outside, and it's in spring, like right now. The wind's blowing hard, stirring up everything, that often can do it too. Yes, we can have it for many other reasons too, but Asthma is so common, it's now 40 million in the U.S. Uh, have it. It's increasing in, in uh, trend. Four components of asthma management, monitoring it, assessment and monitoring, education, again, the trigger is so important, controlling the environment and the comorbid factors, meaning if there's other factors that are involved related to things such as, guess what? rhinitis or sinusitis. I often say that the complications of asthma often triggers, besides the obvious triggers like infections and all, is from upstairs and from downstairs. If the activity is going on up here, it's going to affect asthma. If you've got problems like with GERD, acid reflux, it will affect asthma also if there's, uh, if there's that going on. So need to be aware of that. Goal of asthma therapy. I wanted just to point out a few things in, in, in those who, to, who have this. Uh, the goal of therapy, of course, is always to decrease symptoms and to uh, control it to a level that is uh, comfortable. But so many times patients with asthma say that they're well controlled and yet they're using their inhaler, their short-acting inhaler called albuterol, comes by several names, Proventil, Ventolin, Proair, Zopinex. <clears throat> And they're using it daily. Oh, but I'm controlling it. Look at the second line up there. Requires to, to reduce the impairment, the goal of therapy is to require infrequent use of inhaled, that stands for short-acting beta agonist, which means albuterol, basically. So less than two times a week. So if someone's having symptoms enough that they need their albuterol, now I'm not talking about COPD now, I'm talking about asthma. If they're needing it, their inhaler, more than a couple of times a week. We're not talking about preventative use either, and we're not talking about for prevention of exercise-induced asthma. We're talking about for symptoms. Then they don't have well-controlled asthma, and that just blows a lot of people away. And what do you mean? I, I control it, but yeah, I have to use it most of the days of the week, or I have to use it every day of the week. No. That means they need to step up with their controller medicine, which is another type of med another category of medicine, which most of you have at least heard about by advertisements on TV or in magazines, like Advir, Simbacort, Flovent, many, many, many options that we have for controller medicines that are typically used on a daily basis to prevent symptoms from coming up so you don't need to use a short-acting agent like an albuterol. We want to have normal lung function. We want to maintain normal activity in all patients 
at least 95% of the time or more often, certainly triggers will, in, will cause problems with asthma uh, that uh, for short periods of time that they may not be able to do a physical activity. But the high, high majority of the time, it should be accomplished and only that 5% of individuals who have severe asthma, yes, that's a different story. But the high, high majority, obviously, that have the mild and moderate levels should be easily controlled the high majority of the time. Now, this is, this is going to be a bad thing I'm going to say in reference to uh, both patients and doctors. <laughs> and that is this. The most common form of treatment error for persistent asthma, meaning mild or moderate persistent asthma, is under treatment. The patient doesn't want, oh, I don't feel that bad. I don't think I need to take it. But then I, then I get in, in trouble. Then I take the medicine, they're on the roller coaster. Doesn't have to be that way. Okay, that's enough of that. So we assess the situation and monitor it. Has to be followed up. Any chronic condition, this is another little general thing that transcends asthma or any other condition. And that is that any condition, any chronic condition that requires a form of treatment should be monitored on a regular basis by a physician. Okay, maybe it's once every six months, maybe it's just once a year. Maybe it needs to be followed up the next day or the next week or the next month. If you're on a medication, you need to be followed up. Classification of asthma control. If you look at this, this is a general, this is by the National Expert Panel that came up with this. Uh, I think it was 2007. And it shows what well controlled is, not well controlled, and very poorly controlled. And if you look at that and you go, my goodness, well controlled, and that should be the high, high percent of the time we are falling short with a lot of our patients with asthma. Having symptoms less than two days a week. Nighttime awakening less than two times a month. Uh, short act needing the albuterol type of inhaler, the immediate acting inhaler, again, no more than two times a week having normal lung function and uh, normal quality of life questionnaires and uh, no more than one exacerbation a year. Environmental control, so important. Know those triggers, keep away from them. The different steps of therapy um, the, um, with, the, with the different levels uh, and the different medications that we have available for treatment. I'm not going to go, obviously, over detail because we don't have the time to, but is that the last one? Wow, cool. Okay, insect sting allergy is, uh, is probably uh, my top one or two interest levels, and uh, my chief way back when I was in training was a national expert on anaphylaxis, which basically means a, the most severe form of an allergic reaction, which causes either uh, near death or or is fatal. When we talk about insect sting allergy, this is one we typically do have a few fatalities here. Now, I'm not talking about the massive stings from the Africanized bee. I'm talking about just getting one sting. I'll never forget when we had the Africanized bees first arrive in the valley in 1990, they had made front page news, front page news, the first colony in, in, in the town of Hidalgo. And then it was uh, about a week later, it wasn't very long at all after that, that on the second page of the newspaper, it had a relatively well-known individual in Harlingen, age 52, who died with one wasting. One wasting. So, you know, the, of course the news wants to make news with what they want to make. The news is what the news says is the news. And I just thought that that's incredible that you have that, that huge risk factor. We had uh, someone, you know that Bike Fest, probably all of you know, that Bike Fest just ended at the island? Two years ago at Bike Fest when a group was coming back from the island back to Harlingen, a, an engineer working in one of the healthcare facilities, not here, uh, died with one bee sting on the way back between uh, the island and uh, Los Fresnos. So 
this needs to be taken very seriously and unfortunately when patients have that they wait too long when they begin to feel something happening to present and that's the most vulnerable time is you know a lot of people are also aware we're going to the last we're going to finish up with is food allergy and the same thing happens with food allergy if anybody knows someone who has an insect sting reaction where it went to a dramatic level very shortly or if you know someone who has say shrimp allergy or peanut allergy who had that severe reaction that was life-threatening that's what we're talking about that is anaphylaxis and so it's a very very difficult uh, difficult situation when it happens because when it hits it hits and it's it's hard and fast and uh, action needs to be taken place quickly um, the normal type reactions that are local reactions even large local reactions I'm not talking about that we're talking about those who get the sting and typically within minutes they begin to have trouble with breathing. They often have rash and itching all over and it progresses so rapidly that it can be uh, life-threatening or fatal uh, within minutes. And the other shame about it is, I think to a degree, is that we know that when patients present to the emergency room and they get taken care of and whatever at that level, there is a treatment and it's listed right down there at, towards the bottom Venom immunotherapy, this is allergy injections, reduces reaction rate on re-sting from 40 to 60 percent. In other words, those that have a severe reaction will have a 40 to 60 percent chance of having the similar type of most severe reaction. Why it's not higher than that, why, you know, that, I don't know, but that same level. They may have a mild reaction, uh, others, but 40 to 60 will have that same level. But if someone is on the definitive therapy for it, it's basically a cure. And most patients who have that life-threatening anaphylactic reaction are never told that. So it's one of my missions to always bring that out, that if you know someone who's had a reaction that was not, we're not talking about a local skin reaction, large reaction, you need to tell them to go to an allergy specialist, and only board certified allergists will deal with this, because this is strong stuff we're dealing with. This is effectively a cure, okay? There have been lawsuits over this issue also, by the way, where uh, their doctor has not told them about this definitive treatment, and I hate to say it, but that's, that's the way it is. Okay, so we're gonna take some pictures of some. Wasp, bee, or yellow jacket? Anybody wanna call it out? Like yellow jacket. Yellow jacket, yellow jacket? Wasp. Wasp. Oh. <laughs> Yellow jacket wasp. <laughs> Did I tell you to take these titles off? This is supposed to be a quiz. Everybody, everybody here is supposed to be familiar with the wasp. The difference with the uh, yellow jacket is extremely bright colors. A little shorter, a little fatter than the wasp, than the paper wasp. This is what we have the most of here between the two. We really don't have yellow jackets per se. I mean, there's always exceptions, but per se. Hornets we also don't have here. Those things are huge in comparison to the other ones. Those can be uh, up to this size and are, are big. They're pretty awesome. And then um, here's the typical honeybee. And the Africanized bee will look exactly the same. You cannot differentiate them by the visual, only by uh, microscopic evaluations or, genetic, uh, or genetics. And then, is everybody familiar with the fire ant? Oh man, that is a nasty critter. And we're gonna show you a picture of one here. Uh, there's the distribution uh, through the years, in the, basically in the south and southeast part of the country. There's a fire ant doing its thing, grabs on with its mandibles and stings, has a stinger and injects venom in the back end. If you don't knock it off, it will rotate on those mandibles and repeatedly sting. And there's someone who, I don't know what he was doing, but doesn't sound like, doesn't look like it was very bright, whatever it was. These are described as pustules once they come up, but they're sterile, meaning that the pustules are not infected. The, in the venom, it degrades the tissue on the surface and causes it to, the tissue to degrade into a pus-like material. 
and there's another example of it of kind of just showing, going through the evolution of the uh, sting and how it looks through time. Okay. Uh, everybody familiar with EpiPen? This is the emergency in direct in injector for those who have anaphylaxis, the life-threatening type. Of, this is actually epinephrine, adrenaline. This is available by prescription, and it is for individuals who have the condition, either with food or insect anaphylaxis, to have this available, or an anaphylaxis due to unknown reason. And it uh, automatically will inject the epinephrine. Safety is taken off off the cap and then you in the middle thigh area push it in it automatically the needle comes out and injects the medication hold it in place for it they recommend 10 seconds and then go to the emergency room the individual that I mentioned it's not 100 percent effective but it's very much life-saving the individual I was mentioning that went to bike fest that was two years ago he actually administered this because he had the history and it did not save him uh, but that, that's what you need to have. And here's the newer version. Here's a newer version. This is a cool one because people forget how to use this one. This one came on the market about a year ago or so. This is pretty cool. The size of it and all. And this trainer contains no needle or drug. Talks to you. If you are ready to use, pull off red safety guard. Pretty cool, huh? Three, two, one. Injection complete. <laughs> this trainer may be reused for training purposes. Okay, so that's that's the emergency epinephrine that we have available, and it's really, really, you know, improved over the years. So the last area, just to mention a few things about food allergy. Uh, Almost everybody knows somebody with a food allergy. Okay, there's listed. But everybody who thinks they have food allergies often don't. But here you go. This is one of the probably the most important things that you'll see on the, on the in reference to the food allergy part. That 90% are related to eight foods, and there they are. 90% of food allergy is related to one of those. Milk, peanuts, eggs, tree nuts, wheat, fish, soybean, or shellfish. You may know that, gosh, it's been about seven years ago, I guess, that the uh, requirement federal law that if you have one of these foods in a product, packaged product, it has to be clearly labeled as this product has a milk component or an egg component. Because the old method was you have to put the ingredients on there by law in the order of the concentration that they are in the product. Well, how does someone know that in the ingredient section that ovalbumin is one of the common proteins in eggs? And it's, by, by the way, happens to be one of the most common allergens in eggs, but it didn't say eggs. Or lactalbumin is in a product. That's a milk component. Anyway, so they came up with this saying that, yes, it puts that in the ingredients, but you have, it, have to have it clearly stated on the label if it has one of these eight items in it that it's on the, the food product label. Okay, basics. Role of the immune system is to protect the body from germs and disease. Food allergy is an abnormal response by the immune system to a food protein, typically a food protein, not the oil, okay? When the food is eaten, the immune system thinks the food is harmful and releases histamine and other chemicals to attack the enemy. But that, in that case, it has, you know, to, uh, it attacks you because it's, think it's a misdirected. There's no cure for food allergies, although they are looking into it and the research is looking better. We may have a desensitization program for foods before too much longer. Avoidance of ingestion of the allergenic food is the only way to prevent a reaction from occurring. I, I, I don't know if it's in this slide set, but I'll, I'll bring it up. 
that if in polls that have asked how many, what percent of the population, do you feel like you have a food allergy? The numbers are typically around 35, 39% of the population to feel like they do. In actuality, it's 2% of adults and about 8% of children. But people may have food intolerance that's not an allergy or other types of adverse reactions. And for example, it's talking about that in this slide here. So an adverse reaction, for example, could be somebody who says, I'm allergic to caffeine. Well, they take it because it tears up their stomach or spicy food. That's not an allergy. That's an intolerance. Lactose intolerance is a lactose uh, type of intolerance that is a lactase enzyme deficiency. So you have that. That is not an allergy. Gluten sensitivity is not an allergy. But they are certainly adverse reactions to foods from a different context. Here's a list a few of these that we're talking about. My knowledge of the slide sets here. Okay, so anyway, if you have a reaction to a food, of course it can affect any of these areas, any one or multiple of these areas. And at the bottom it says, when we talked about anaphylaxis, when it's a more generalized reaction comprising multiple of these symptoms, that's typically anaphylaxis. And here's a few uh, examples of how that can present. Uh, feeling as if there's a sensation of swelling in the throat or actual difficulty breathing. The swelling of the lips as shown in one of the slides there. A nasty rash. I'm not even sure what that rash is right there, but it's a pretty nasty looking rash there. And then of course you can often you know, have gastrointestinal symptoms. This is uh, in, obviously with children there. It, it, it's really difficult to evaluate uh, food allergy at times, and sometimes it can be the easiest evaluation. I ate some shrimp and I had a severe reaction. Okay, I had something with peanut butter and da, 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 reaction. No, the, the, there's, it's very easy. Other times, though, it can be very difficult to identify. You go through the history, you do what you can. We do have testing, we have skin testing for it, we have serum testing for foods, uh, and there's not one that's better than the other, but skin testing in professionals' hands who know what they're doing is generally regarded as the, the main test, and it's a lot less expensive, and for example, insurance companies often limit how many serum tests you can do because it is quite a bit more expensive. We often will say it this way. The allergy test, doesn't matter whether it's skin testing or serum testing, is much more accurate if it's negative. That rules it out. That basically rules out an allergy. Doesn't rule out other adverse reactions to foods, but it's very effective at ruling it out. Not 100%, but it's pretty darn close. But if the test is positive, it does not mean you're allergic. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, physicians who will order serum tests and some who will do skin testing and will state that every positive test to any degree, oh, you're allergic, avoid that, and into, into, the, into the topic. That is so wrong, it is horrible. So don't, if you ever hear that, it has to be correlated with the history. If it correlates well with the history, that's it. You've confirmed it with the test. But if it's like, well, Okay, that's positive, but I'm not sure that really fits. As long as it's not a severe reaction we're talking about, if we're talking about a rash, if we're talking about something that's relatively mild, we typically recommend with a positive test that is a, it is a suspect. We recommend an avoidance time period of two to four weeks and then a graded challenge. The graded challenge is where you, <laughs> the first day you get the tiniest little piece where you can't really even hardly recognize what it is. No reaction, the next day you have a small piece, no problem, then you have a bite or two of that food. That is the confirmatory test then, okay? Now we don't play games, of course, with the stronger reactions doing any of that challenge business, but that's what has to be done. Um, if it's a little bit more of a reaction and you're a little more concerned about it, we do the oral food challenge in the office. So depending on what the history is, it takes us in that direction. But I, I, I hate to see so many, I, I'll never forget, I've got so many cases of children who've been evaluated and told to avoid all these foods. And, and, and if, it's truly, if it's really true, they need to be with a dietitian and get a nutritional type of consult. 
anyway, and so often it isn't. I had an elderly lady who was avoiding the foods that were by some testing done 10 years ago, 10 years before, and weighed about 85 pounds, and she finally decided to get another opinion. She didn't have one food allergy. That's, that's how it happens, unfortunately. So anyway, you have to be, have to be careful with what you're doing and, and, and do it right. Okay. I think I'm going to finish about there. Okay, I'm going to finish there. Again, I got pamphlets over here uh, that if you want to come pick some up, and I thank you for your attention.